Thanks, everybody. So we have a kind of a good mix of different business models. Um, I want to kind of start with Jack at the at the far end, just to level set the audience in terms of uh, scale of your business and, and what are your principal products and revenue streams offered. Uh, I'm Jack Waters. I'm the president of Zayo's Fiber Business, small little fiber provider. Now we're a fairly large uh, at scale fiber provider. Um, I think probably well deserve the credit the the team, the original team for inventing the communications infrastructure sector. Um, we operate in the U.S., Canada, and, uh, and Western Europe as well. Good answer. Good. Well, I'm Jeff Uphews. I'm the CEO of DC Blocks. We're a company that designs, builds, and architects edge data centers, predominantly in the Southeast United States. Uh, we're building in highly underserved markets, and we connect them back all with either dark fiber and a super low latency uh, environment uh, to push traffic back in and out of exchanges. Don, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Don McNeil, CEO of Fiberlight, a uh, regional fiber provider here in the U.S. that f fights well above its weight class against the likes of Jack and others. Um, but uh, pr predominantly focused up in the mid-Atlantic, I think uh, Washington, D.C., Ashburn, Atlanta, Tampa, and then uh, th all throughout Texas. I want to start off with Jeff uh, in, the, in the middle. You, you mentioned the word latency. And um, how, how do you think about balancing latency versus location? And, and uh, what are your views on that? Well, John, it really all comes down to the customer. And it comes down to certain apps are bandwidth heavy, certain apps are latency heavy. Uh, you know, as an example, if you're looking at more of the CDNs, it's a lot around bandwidth. If you're looking more around gaming, gaming and what takes place is really driven around latency sensitive applications. When you look at other things in the market, especially like storage, storage proximity needs both bandwidth because you need high output of files transferring between places as well as bandwidth. Uh, you know, the bandwidth and the latency go hand in hand because you want quick access to it, but you need a big pipe to be able to drive it in and out of where it's going. So the balance between latency and bandwidth really comes down to the application. Uh, it's all about the application and it's all about the network and how you're interacting with it. So as you, as you look at your footprint, um, there's a mix of different size markets. How is that kind of reflected in, in the customer mix that you're seeing in, in larger versus medium sized locations? Yeah, so uh, a real good example is, you know, we have a large city that has a uh, you know, public transportation system and they need to have a disaster recovery system. And through that, you know, they look at us and they say, how do I then get the most critical applications outside of the impact zone of a market like Atlanta? And in this case, it was up into Chattanooga. So we have a data uh, network that is all private that runs eight and a half terabits per second of total capacity of what we have on it. So we were able to move data at the speed of light, sub two millisecond latency, uh, you know, data center to data center in a round trip environment on diverse paths. So they needed to have critical elements that fit in there. That was a critical one. Another one is a you know large healthcare company that is in uh, you know, a market like Huntsville, Alabama, which you know is Rocket City. There's so many companies that are there. NASA's there's Boeing there and others. Genomic life sciences is driving huge amount, terabits and terabits of files and file storage. They need to have multiple copies in the network, some in Atlanta, some in Huntsville, Alabama. How do you utilize the network to do that? It all comes down to, you know, how you push data. So that, that's a good, interesting, um, kind of illustrative set of use cases. Don, um, do you have any kind of use cases that you care to point out that you're seeing in, in your business or around edge? Yeah, I, I think uh, Jeff touched on one. You know, so if you think broadly about just kind of the consumer side of things, you know, I, I think the, what's most relevant for all of us as consumers is, you know, I like to use the example of uh, the channel guide. So if you're sitting there and you probably have experienced where you're flicking through your TV channel guide and you click the button several times and nothing moves. And the next thing you know, you turn around and it jumps down 100 channels and you're fighting back and forth. That's latency. And, and if you think about you know, some of the early days, you know, I, I spent a few years at EdgeConnects, and uh, that was really one of the problems we helped the, the cable TV operator solve with the, the proximity of the end user. And then by extension of that was just simply the idea of you know, streaming over the top video, which is you know, only increasing. So you know, the, the, the quality, the buffering time, and uh, and more importantly, just the, uh, the overall customer experience. Uh, that, that's a great example. I think as you look on to the, the infrastructure side, you know, certainly mobility uh, is starting to see more and more uh, small cells and the ability to, and the need to aggregate uh, points of uh, uh, you know, IP in, in, insertion. So uh, being able to optimize uh, you know, the proximity for you know, now small cells, but increasingly things like cloud-based radio access networks um, 
certainly is uh, something that's uh, being deployed now in very, very early stages, but, but those would be some examples of the use cases that we are seeing. Um, so, Jack, you've got a collection of data centers that's national in scope, obviously fiber as well. Um, what infrastructure do you see as being most important for, uh, for the edge? And, and maybe just to kind of take a step back, what, what do we talk about? What, what's the definition that, you're, that you think is most helpful when thinking about even that, that term? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, obviously we'd probably start with fiber first. And, you know, we think that, that the, the infrastructure is, the fiber infrastructure is probably key to everything. As the, as the edge expands, um, you know, I, I love that. I love that uh, any, anybody ever asked me, hey, what do you think, are you worried about wireless taking over for wireline? It's probably the silliest question you could ever imagine because to have more wireless, you need more endpoints, you need more fiber, you need more density. And so, you know, I, I, I view that as just an obvious answer to, we need more fiber, we, we need more um, endpoints. And that's, that's uh, um, I think, inevitable and, and doesn't change, frankly. Um, you know, with respect to data center, it's an important part of our por portfolio today. Um, you know, we like the data center business a lot. I'd say we're, we're kind of in the, in the top 10, maybe not in the, in the top five, but in, you know, in the, in the other half. And we like that business a lot. It's, it's clear that there's a connection between connectivity and data center. And I think that's something that's pretty long lasting. Um, you know, you have been in this business for quite a long time. Any, any kind of con contrasting experiences that you're seeing versus say 10, 15 years ago? Different vocabulary, but I think the same principles apply. I'm sorry, I am So just a kind of a historical perspective, given, given where you've been in the past, 10, 15 years ago, we weren't using the word edge as much, but our- uh, Oh yeah, it, I mean, look, the, the edge is, it's, it's <laughs> number one, it's like the buzzword of, of, I think it may be the buzzword of the conference, but it may be the buzzword of the year. Um, I mean, it, it's just, things have changed so much. And, and uh, it's not that, you know, I think latency matters to all. Um, and, and so, and so, you know, more more dispersion out at the edge is is gonna gonna be something that we 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 see forever. And and frankly, I don't think there's any application that says I don't care about latency. It's it's that some care care more, and and some care less. Which frankly, 10, 15 years ago, you didn't think about at all and worry about latency. It was you know the difference between you know 30 milliseconds and 28 milliseconds was kind of boring. Um, then the, the spread guys came around and said, wow, um, we could actually build a route that somebody might buy that um, would pay a lot of money for. Um, that's a network we ended up buying last year. And, and it turns out that latency really did matter to that market for a really, really, really long time. And I don't think that that's going to change. The, the other thing about the edge that, that I find fascinating is, um, you know, I, I built a little bit of network here in the last 25 years. And... Uh, um, when, when, we, when we built the, the, the last go round, um, we kind of took the tier one markets. We, we all, you know, Dan, myself, a few others sat around and, and picked the, the top tier one cities and said, yeah, we kind of think, you know, MCI, the MCI story was the guys took the airline map and, and looked at where all the flights went and where all the people lived. Um, now, um, you look at where we build network and it's Columbus, Ohio to Ashburn, Virginia. Not, neither of which, no offense to anyone who lives in Ashburn, Don, or <laughs> anybody that lives in Columbus, but not exactly um, what you would have picked 20 years ago as the two kind of center points of demand. And, and here we are building, putting a lot of capital to work to build network between those two locations. Why? Because that's where you know, some of our largest customers have some, some large data centers. Um, and so the edge now isn't as much driven by where people are, kind of is, but it's driven by more to consider. It's driven by where's cheap power, where's cheap land, where can I get, you know, abatements, where can I get all kinds sure. of other things that kind of add up to a more economic place to locate your, your data center, for instance. And, and so I think the edge has, in, in a lot of ways, changed completely from what we thought of uh, uh, 15 years ago.
So the, the examples you pointed to are global players um, having chosen particular locations because of cost of ownership and so forth. I'd like to ask uh, the two others on the panel who re represent kind of more regional footprints, um, what are you seeing from the global guys? What are you seeing from sort of local enterprise? And, and what, what are the fastest growing edge markets in, in, in your business currently, um, both by geography as well as by vertical? So starting off. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll start from, uh, if you look at it, we're in the southeast. So, I mean, I can speak to what we see. We did a really deep analysis around 40 markets. We looked at amount of IP traffic coming in and out of a market, but specifically when you, when you look at a market like Birmingham, Alabama, where we got a large facility going up, um, the first thing that is there to embrace is really the enterprises. You know, many of these markets have, they don't have a tier three data center that is in it. So what they do is they actually uh, build them themselves. And then so many of the companies that built them themselves, you know, some markets, Birmingham's got a dozen you know, corporate data centers. Uh, other markets that we're in have got multiples of that. Uh, that are in the market. So what you look at is you say, hey, how do I get into there? Now I have an asset. They're trying to get out of their asset because they're trying to downsize that. Virtualization has caused them to shrink the footprints. What they built 15 years ago or 10 years ago no longer suits their needs. So the first to jump in are enterprises, state governments, city governments, university systems, uh, the local MSP market. Those are the first to adopt. The second to adopt starts becoming more of the content providers, the CDNs and the others that are now trying to say, I need to get more uh, capabilities into some of these secondary markets. We're seeing more and more of the carriers start coming in saying, there's not an asset that has got close proximity that I can bring all the bandwidth into. So enterprise first, city governments, state governments, university systems, MSPs, then the content guys. And so we think over the course of the next three to five years, we'll pull more and more of the global enterprise out and it's really used a disaster recovery as well from major markets. So Atlanta to Birmingham, it's two hours. Close enough to drive to, you can support it with your same staff. Uh, you know, if you have an issue, you know, it's, it's in a different power zone in a power grid. And then to what Jack's saying around tax incentives, you know, cost of doing business, it's a much, much easier place. John, what are you seeing? Uh, from the enterprise perspective, I think one of the big drivers for uh, latency or more importantly, ultimately, to get to the core is uh, cloud direct connect. So I, you know, I think in the early phases of cloud adoption, the internet was sufficient uh, because if you think about it, it was a very static uh, workload. You were pushing things into the cloud only to come back later you know, for purposes of storage, either to do some computation and get an answer or to just simply store things. Now, as you move up and get more into platforms and software as a service, you know, true applications, um, having that congestion problem where your, your application is commingled with best effort internet traffic is, is insufficient. So you're starting to see early days, early phases of you know, being able to directly connect into those cloud environments for purposes of certainly number one performance and secondarily, I think, security. Um, when it comes to the, uh, you know, the, the global players, you know, I think Jack touched on it as well, just new and, new and dedicated routes. So if you think about some place like, for example, Ashburn and Columbus, as Jack referenced, I mean, these are, you know, these are turn into be multi hundred million close approaching a billion dollar campuses. And, and the idea of connectivity between these uh, becomes very, very critical for number one, reliability and redundancy. And then more importantly, just the, the bandwidth. So new and dedicated routes that are, you know, away from the old, the, the legacy typical routes are emerging all the time. And, you know, you can certainly see a, a, a coast to coast overbuild that will take place uh, over the next several years that will uh, be more dedicated to these large, uh, you know, these large uh, plots or these large campuses, if you will. So we, we have a little bit of time for audience questions. So if you have any, um, make yourself uh, visible. Um, one one topic that um, you didn't, none of you mentioned at this point, was sort of SDN and um, new bandwidth features and how they kind of play in the ecosystem. So starting with you, Don, and then and then working our way down, I'd love to kind of get your your views on that. Yeah, I think, um, I think the best application that's most relevant and, and near term as, as I see it is um, for SDN is this, this cloud connectivity. So certainly several players in the market and, and increasingly I think many of the service providers are, you know, how do you solve that cloud connectivity problem where rather than having multiple connections to, to go to each and every uh, cloud platform, being able to unify it and then take advantage of, you know, more and more software and being able to carve up the, the, that pipe to uh, be allocated very dynamically to the cloud, you know, the cloud platform of choice. So, I think that one's relevant. It's a it's a relevant use case, and it's uh, being very quickly adopted. I think. 
Yeah, it's having the flexibility. I mean, we, we run a virtual cross-connect platform, so you know, we could have carriers that built into our Huntsville facility or built into our Chattanooga facility or built into our Birmingham facility. And for us, we literally virtually cross-connect that all across our private network, and we bring them into the exchanges where, to Don's point, they have full access into, uh, you know, we had a large bank that said, I need to have access into Workday. So how did they get there? They just have virtual cross-connect come directly in through us, uh, you know, cross-connect into the main internet exchange into a market like Atlanta, and then you have the ability to deliver that service in a private network rather than uh, a public network. SDN, Jack. Yeah, so I, I, don't think, um, I don't think you have to look far for the, the, the notion that SDN is, is driven by some new application is kind of a funny one to me as a technology guy at heart. Um, we have kind of been brute forcing network configuration as an industry for the last 20 years. And, you know, automation has not exactly been, and, and this is, I'm painting a very wide brush to all of my peers um, at, as well, that we didn't do a great job in configuration um, of, of networks for, for decades. And, and what SCN is, in my opinion, is first and foremost, something that helps us with configuration and automation of all the things that we did by hand for way, way too long. Um, it lacked standards, it lacked um, common interfaces, all, all, all things that, you know, for, for a long time you just didn't have. You had nice TL1 interfaces for those that remember those things, um, or, or, you know, ba basically serial interfaces to configure boxes. But, but uh, I don't think you have to look far for, for new, at new applications and say, what do we need to automate? I agree that things like Cloud Connect and Cloud Link, we have, we have a similar product. Those are all things that that deserve to be automated and, and uh, you know, have very little, if any, human touch at all. But trust me, I think there's a hundred things that we've been doing for a long time that, that deserve to be automated as well. And, and that's what I think SDN is probably seeing more, more traction for than anything else. We had a question here. If you look at the markets where you are working on, you look at the competition, what is having the biggest impact in the competition and the markets you're working on? Is that regulation or the technological development in, in those industries you're working in? I, my opinion is that regulation has very little to do, at least in the markets that, that we operate in. Um, you know, there's always a worry here or there, but I think it, you know, what's driving our business more than anything is changes in basic ways that enterprise solve their IT needs first and foremost, hence all the, the movement to public cloud as well as public data center and along with a insatiable need for, for connectivity, fiber infrastructure. The second is around, is around um, I said it first, 5G. Um, and, and I do believe that, that you know, the, the notion that densification of wireless networks, whether it's whether it's LTE densification or 5G, you could pick your flavor on when it actually happens. Um, there's no doubt at 160,000 endpoints today as, as you count around macro towers and probably five to 10X that um, 10 years from now, uh, you, you, technology is gonna drive infrastructure investment, it's gonna drive fiber investment, it's gonna drive other, other parts of the ecosystem to invest as well. Yeah, well, it'll have to have data centers out in some of these markets where you're driving that 5G adoption. So when you, uh, when you look at for us and answering, you know, does technology change or regulation? Uh, regulation actually helps us, especially when we're going to underserved yet growing markets because uh, to Jack's earlier point, the tax incentives and some of the other things that you can get into markets that are underserved, uh, you know, it, it begs that there hasn't been competition in there. Where do they go? They go into, you know, a market as an example. If I'm in Birmingham, Birmingham is uh, like 1.3 million people in the MSA. It is 200 miles from, or 140 miles from Atlanta. It's a little about, about two hours. You know, the tax incentives for what they give into coming into markets like that, it's to pull business into the state and, and really drive the ability again. But the technology doesn't change. You know, the, uh, uh, you know, the regulation helps us actually in cases like that. And the competition, there hasn't <coughs> been competition in some of these markets because there hasn't been viable products. Um, 
Uh, this mention of 5G, I, I'm, I'm consistently viewed, viewed it as being overhyped. Um, pretty much every 5G device that comes out will spend the bulk of its life on Wi-Fi, especially if it's a consumer device, on someone else's network, which seems to suggest that if mobile edge computing is going to be a big deal, we should already be seeing fixed edge computing for the exact same devices and same applications, some of which have been there for years. I don't think we're seeing it at anywhere near the density that would suggest that the predictions around 5G make sense. Obviously, exceptions on vehicles and outdoor things, but AR, VR headsets, smartphones, PCs, TVs, all connect on Wi-Fi today or via fixed line. Where's the edge compute relating to those? So none of you is a mobile operator, but uh, feel free to. Uh, just I'll go back to my days on Spectrum. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I think initially you'll see it more in campus environments, right? So you certainly can think about, um, uh, for example, a, a manufacturing plant where, you know, certainly it could be done with Wi-Fi. But you know, one of the, one of the things, um, you know, if you think about the throughput and the bandwidth. So so for example, I used to operate uh, LMDS network uh, in the 27 to 31 gigahertz. And having a, a, giga, a one gigahertz of bandwidth available, um, the throughput you can get through those links is, is significant as compared to, say, Wi-Fi. So I can certainly see an environment, you know, maybe initially beginning in the campus, uh, i.e., a, a manufacturing type uh, campus, and um, and then eventually, you know, moving its way out. You know, certainly things like um, you know augmented reality, having having the uh, the smart workforce. You know, being able to, to draw on all the capabilities in and around. Uh, again, I'll use manufacturing as an example. I, I um, you know, I, I think your your question is a good one, um, but I would answer it. It it's sort of to say whether it's overhyped or not needs a time frame, and so you know, I, I don't know whether it's overhyped or not. I'd say it's early, um, and so so you know, you you could draw your own conclusion there. But is it going to happen? I don't think there's a question about that. Um, the one thing I know is, I'm a simple engineer here, but uh, you know, God isn't making more spectrum. And so as end user devices consume more bandwidth, which is inevitable, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Your question is probably, hey, uh, maybe more of that gets served on, on Wi-Fi versus, versus not. I would argue that um, mobility is such a key part of, of you know, devices today that that to think that that only gets served via Wi-Fi, I agree that it probably serves more than it does today, but but probably doesn't serve all the needs. So then draw out the curve, and you know, depending on your consumption rate, if you say if you say end user uh, consumption is growing at 40 to 50 percent, I think that's that's a reasonable number. Um, you just can't get there from here without new technology like 5G. And remember, 5G isn't just about the radio in the in the handset or the end device and 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 in the network. It's it's about leveraging you know more spectrum. It's about leveraging things like you know 27 gigahertz for fixed fixed uh, wireline replacement like cable TV. I mean, there's a lot to 5G that's not not just. Spectrum policy, I, I suspect 5G spectrum policy, among other things. But what I'm saying is that, irrespective of that, we would expect to see all these edge use cases today for fixed devices. And we don't. And fixed, yeah, because even with 5G, 5G total data traffic is probably going to be between 5 and 10% of total residential broadband, optimistically. It's going to vary a bit by country. But I'm not seeing fixed edge compute today, which makes me doubt the requirements of mobile edge compute in the future. Well, I mean, I, I would offer, don't, it, it's like anything in a distributed system. I, I always use like the, the electric grid analogy. So if you think about where you, you generate, you transmit, and, and then you distribute, um, don't you think we're in the early days of you know, these large concentrations of cloud computing? They just happen to be in very scalable locations because that's where we begin. But there's certainly an argument that just like there, there's an evolution in having, you know, moving generation plants and substations further and further out, it, it, that, that'll be kind of where I think your fixed line edge compute starts to, to get there. I mean, we're, we're still very early. But um, th that's how I think about it. It's just, it's just an evolution. 
that where we, instead of everything being concentrated in Ashburn, hey, guess what? There's some stuff down in North Carolina. There's stuff moving to Columbus. And so the, the movement is beginning, and it's just going to become a matter of time, I think, before every major metro has two or three uh, compute or storage type things, right? Very well put. That'll have to be the last word, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Um, thank you all for your time. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>